Thank you, Will. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I thought I'd start with just talking a little bit about where the rosary is, for those of you that aren't familiar with it. It um, covers about 14 acres and it's situated between Rosary Road and Telegraph Lane in Norwich. There's access from both roads, but there's only vehicular access from Rosary Road itself. That's a general view of one of the avenues in the cemetery showing the chapel, and that's the later chapel that was built in the 1880s. This is another view which is taken from the upper part of the lower cemetery, we call it. The cemetery is divided into two. There's the lower original chapel and there's the upper, sorry, the lower cemetery and the upper cemetery, the upper cemetery being the more modern conventional cemetery, which I'll mention later on. It was opened in 1821 when it was laid out on what was a former market garden known as the Rosary. As far as we're aware, it was the first Christian non-denominational cemetery in England. It was licensed for burials in June of 1821, and the first burial took place later that year. The founder was a man called Thomas Drobbin. He was a retired Presbyterian minister. And I think you could say that the rosary would be described as a, a speculative venture on Drobbin's part. And it was something that was driven by his personal beliefs and experiences. Sadly, he wasn't too run the rosary for too long because he doesn't seem to have been a very good financial manager but in 1841 he was declared bankrupt and the cemetery was taken over by a group of trustees who ran it for over a century. This was really the golden age of the rosary, the late 19th century and into the early 20th but by 1954 the trustees themselves were struggling to uh, maintain the cemetery to the standard they wanted, income was dropping, and they were finding that the number of burials was decreasing. So they decided to pass it over to the city council, who continue to own and manage it to this day. This is Thomas Drummond, our founder, and the reason that we're here today, I suppose. He was born in 1764. His father was a peruke maker and a barber at Lower Goat Lane. And I must say, I had to look up what perukes were. Uh, they're curly wigs, short curly wigs, which are gathered at the back. And apparently the benefits were that of wearing them, that they needed a little maintenance, but they were quite easy to de -louse. <laughs> The Drummond family were non-conformists. They were dissenters, but they worshipped, the family worshipped at the Octagon Chapel in Colgate. In his teens, Thomas attended the Hoxton Academy for dissenters. It was the academy set up to provide a um, further education for dissenting families who were not allowed to go to the uh, then universities. Upon his return to Norwich in the 1780s, he established a small school, probably in St. Faith's Lane, and began, began styling himself as the Reverend Thomas Drummond. He later moved to Ormsby, where he was also the minister at the Presbyterian Chapel at Philby. But by 1809, he'd moved again. This time he'd moved to Ipswich, to what became the Friars Street Meeting House, where he was the minister, and he subsequently married the daughter of his predecessor there. He retired at what seems to be the early age of 50 for the time. He returned to Norwich. He established another school in Norwich, and took an active part in the intellectual life of the city. He gave public talks, he put on scientific demonstrations, and he was a vociferous correspondent in the local press, challenging the orthodoxies of the time. And it was about this time he conceived the idea of opening a cemetery. In his words, the cemetery was to be for the use of persons of all sects and denominations. He was very, very aware of the prejudice and discrimination that was suffered by his fellow dissenters, Unitarians, Congregationalists, Baptists. If buried in the parish churchyard, they were obliged to accept the Church of England burial service. And for them, that quite often wasn't acceptable. And it was not unknown for 
Anglican clergymen to refuse to bury known dissenters, particularly if they thought they hadn't been baptised in the Church of England. And Drummond had an experience of this at first hand from his time in Ipswich. In October of 1808, he baptised a child called Harriet Durham, who was dangerously ill. When the child subsequently died, the mother asked the curate of the local church whether she could be bury the child in the churchyard. When the curate discovered that Drummond had baptised the child, Drummond being a dissenting minister, he refused. So the child had to be buried without any service, much to the distress of the mother. Dissenters faced a lot of other restrictions. They were obliged to quite often pay tithes towards a parish church which they didn't attend. They were not eligible to attend Oxford or Cambridge universities, which were reserved for Anglicans. And in many cases, dissenters were prevented from taking public office, such as a councillor or something similar. Although in many cases that was that was ignored, particularly in places like Norwich, where dissent, dissent was very strong. They were not eligible to be a member of parliament until about the 1830s, and dissenters understandably strongly resented these restrictions and challenged them. And one way they challenged them was by establishing cemeteries where they and their families could be buried. And this was particularly notable in places like Norwich, Nottingham and Manchester, where dissent was very strong. There was an emerging middle class, which was being increasingly successful, and they wanted to have their say in the way that their lives were governed. Soon after his return to Norwich, Drummond found he had the means to establish a cemetery. He used a legacy of just over £3,000 that had been left to his wife Anne to buy the five acres on the Thorpe Road. His family and correspondence that we've seen later claimed that Drummond had spent over £80,000 on the cemetery, but to be honest, that seems an enormous amount in those times. It's three or four hundred thousand pounds. It just seems unlikely. But nevertheless, he bought the land, he laid it out with paths, trees, shrubs, to make it as attractive as possible to prospective customers. Each section was given a letter, and within each section, each plot was numbered, so it's relatively easy to locate graves. And even today, even if there isn't a headstone, using Drummond's system, we could usually find a plot for, for somebody. So if you're looking for someone who's buried there, have a word with me afterwards. Drummond was not averse to promoting his cemetery, and he really had to do this to encourage people to make use of it. And in 1836, he claimed that the rosary could accommodate 30,000 interments, <coughs> excuse me, with each family, with each family grave being dug 12 feet deep, which would provide space for five corpses, each separated either by a plank or by a stone flag. And you can still do that today if you buy a grave at the rosary. If you buy a family eight by two plot, and you've got other members of the household to follow you, you can pop them in one on top of the other. I don't think that's the term they use, but that's what you do. <laughs> a small wooden chapel was built by the entrance, not the current one, but uh, a much smaller, rather basic place. Um, Drummond wanted to encourage his friends to support him, so he issued 500 shares in the rosary. And the shareholders were a mixture of artisans, local um, artists and business people. People such as James Mottram, who was the chief clerk at Gurney's Bank on what's now Bank Plain, James Stark, the Norwich School artist, and Isaac Wiseman, who was a wine merchant in Bedford Street. And one of the benefits if you became a shareholder was that you got a free plot. So that was quite an attract attraction. In order to open the cemetery, Drummond had to over overcome one hurdle, and that was getting the cemetery license, because each cemetery had to be licensed by the bishop. But in this case, Drummond was very, very fortunate, because the then Bishop of Norwich, Henry Balfurst, was very supportive of dissenters and liked to work with them, rather than take a, um, a harsh view towards people who were not of his persuasion. So the bishop licensed the rosary in June 1821, 
and he went even further than that by saying that it the decree it could be unconsecrated which was most unusual because nearly every other burial ground was consecrated Drummond also had two houses built at the rosary next door to it where the city supporters club is now one was for him and the other one was for the superintendent who, who more or less ran the cemetery for him the first superintendent was a man called British Dew who appears to have been a jack of all trades he did the grave digging he kept the cemetery in good order and he worked at the cemetery for about 30 odd years until he died in 1876. I think Dew was also probably a market gardener because in the 1841 census he's just recorded as a gardener and usually that's an indication that he was acting as a commercial gardener. I think there were pretty good reasons for Drummond to think that the cemetery would be successful. The population of Norwich was growing quickly. It would triple during the 19th century from about 37,000 in 1801 to more than 100,000 in 1901. There was also a high mortality rate. Living conditions in the city were squalid, particularly in the inner city, where many lived in the cramped courts and yards. Drinking water was taken from the river, or in some cases, from the pumps. I'm sure some of you are, whoops, sorry about that. Some of you are familiar with this pump, which is at the bottom of the churchyard of St John Matter Market. And one of the reasons that disease was, if not endemic, it was quite common, was that many of these church, these pubs, stood at the base of churchyards. And if you know St John Matter Market, you'll know that this pub is here and the churchyard slopes up the hill. And the consequences, I think you can readily imagine. And the city's first uh, officer of health was reputed to have said that the water from one pump in the city was almost pure essence of churchyard. <laughs> Somebody, however, pointed out that the water was bright and sparkly. And he said, oh, yes, that's because that's they're the nitrates from the decaying human matter in the churchyard. So waterborne diseases were not uncommon and there were three outbreaks of cholera in Norwich during the 19th century and even as late as 1898 there were 98 deaths from typhoid in that year sanitation was poor most people used a common privy in the yard or court and the sewage was either carted away for fertilizing the fields outside the city or it went straight into the river and what made things worse was that there was limited space for burials. The city's churchyards were full. They were effectively full to overflowing and had been for several hundred years. And as early as 1671, when John Evelyn the diarist visited Norwich, he commented, and I'll read you what he said. <clears throat> One thing I observed, that most of the churchyards were filled up with earth, or rather the congestion of dead bodies, one upon another, to the very tops of the walls, so as the churches seem to be built in pits. Yet, after Evelyn's visit in 1671, the churchyards continued in use for almost a further 200 years. And as late as 1850, a visitor to the city commented that whenever grass was disturbed in the churchyard, human rain, remains became visible. And even today, if you walk around the city centre and look at, for example, St Stephen's Church or St John Matter Market, you can see that the level of the churchyard is, I suppose, four, five, even six feet higher than the roadway outside. And that's the accumulation of human remains over getting on for a thousand years. There were other cemeteries in Norwich for particular de denominations. This is a picture of what was once the octagon burial ground off Colgate. The old meeting house, a little bit further down Colgate, also had its own burial ground. There was a Quaker burial ground in Gildencroft, and there had been a number of Jewish burial grounds. There was one on Mariner's Lane that's been built over oh, a long time ago, 
there's the one at Gilded Croft, which was open for about 40 years during the middle of the 19th century, and it's now closed and rather overgrown. But there were no restrictions on people being buried in the rosary, regardless of their denomination, whether you were a Baptist, whether you were Jewish, whether you were a Congregationist. But burial at the rosary was not free. It was very much, uh, it wasn't an equal opportunity cemetery, if I can put it like that. You had to be able to pay the fees. I wasn't able to find, when I did a lot of my research here at the record office on the rosary, any price list for when it opened in 1821. But what I have come across is this. This price list dates from, I think, about 1841 probably just after Drummond's bankruptcy. And you can see that there's a, a price is charged for everything. For example, it would have cost you five guineas to, bear, to buy an eight foot square plot. Or if you just wanted a single grave, eight foot for two, that would have been two guineas. If you wanted a brick built vault, that was a further two guineas. And each interment would have cost you 15 shillings. If you wanted to use the services of Thomas Drummond to carry out the service, that was a further uh, five, that was five shillings. If you wanted to bring along a clergyman of your choice, that was only two and sixpence. So you could see that they were quite substantial prices in the 1840s, so you had to be relatively comfortable to be able to bury your loved ones at the rosary. The first per burial took place in 1819, and it must have been a very sad occasion for Thomas Drummond, because it was that of his wife Anne. She had died two years before. She'd been buried at the uh, burial ground of the Octagon, but he exhumed the body and buried her at the Rosary. And this, I'm afraid the picture's not particularly clear, but this here is the family too. But that's where Anne was reburied in the November of 1821 after the bishop had licensed the rosary for burials. He also erected the large urn, but there's another one that you can't see. And that was to commemorate his father and mother, and the other to commemorate his in laws who were buried elsewhere. And I think the reason he did this was to show to people that. The cemetery was a place where you could be buried, you could have confidence that the, the burials would be treated properly. But there was a reluctance to use the new cemetery for, I think, a number of reasons. I think the first one, it was isolated. You have to bear in mind that in 1821, Thorpe Hamlet was not developed. The Foundry Bridge had only been opened in 1812. So that part of the city was market gardens and a wooded area, and very few people lived there. It was new. It was something that people had to be persuaded to accept. They were used to burying their loved ones in churchyards and to bury them in what was effectively a field, even though it was laid out with shrubs and trees, was something that they had to come to accept. There was also strong opposition from people who felt it was wrong to bury people in unconsecrated ground. And there were a number of very vociferous opponents of Drummond's proposal who wrote regularly to the local press criticizing him, forcing Drummond to reply, justifying what he was doing and appealing for tolerance. But perhaps the most visceral um, fear that people had was the fear of body snatches. And it was a very real fear in the 1820s during that period, there were groups of body snatchers or resurrection men, as they were known, who would open the grave of a newly buried person, remove the body, replace the earth in the hope that nobody would notice that they'd stolen the corpse. Stealing a corpse was treated as a misdemeanor. But if you were to steal the corpse and the coffin or the shroud, that was treated as a felony for which you were likely to be transported and possibly suffer a death sentence. What happened was that the corpses were bought by medical schools, usually in London, for their pupils to practice dissection. 
Prior to the 19th century, the schools had re relied on receiving corpses of executed criminals, but as the number of capitals, uh, uh, the number of ex public executions dropped, there were insufficient corpses um, available for dissection. So there was a room for the body snatchers to move in and meet the need, as it were. There were a number of instances in Norwich, and a particularly, a particularly notorious case in Great Yarmouth, where people were found to have raided a, a churchyard, taken the body, folded it up, and put it in a box. And the box was described as being akin to something used by a milliner, taken it to the local pub, where it would have been put on the coach to go to London. It was quite a surprise, I think, if they lo looked in the box to see what was there. <clears throat> the practice of body snatching was really only stopped by the passing of the Anatomy Act in 1832. This permitted unclaimed bodies, such as those who died without no next of kin or in workhouses, to be made available for dissection. However, despite all Drummond's efforts and the support of his shareholders, the early years were a struggle for the new cemetery. After the reburial of Anne Drummond in 1821, there were only two burials the following year. There were none in 1823 and only three in 1824. So I think the Rotary must have been a rather forlorn and perhaps empty place in those early years. But things slowly started to pick up. And 10 years after the Rosary first opened, there were up to about 50 burials a year. And this would in turn would have increased the income received by Drummond, and it was which was helped by the fees that he received for officiating at the burials. And he seems to have officiated at nearly all of the burials who from the time the cemetery opened in 1821 until his health started to fail in the late 1840s. Most of those who chose to be buried at the Rosary were dissenters from the city's many and very well attended chapels. And slowly it became accepted by people <coughs> of stature and people who were part of the governance of the city. And perhaps the most notable was Barnabas Lehman. He'd been mayor in 1813 and again in 1818, and when he died in 1835, he was buried in the Rosary. So I think it demonstrates that councillors and other civic leaders were accepting it. And by the beginning of 1841, 20 years after it had opened, there were nearly a thousand bodies buried at the Rosary. So it was clearly doing well. But I think despite its apparent success, it was struggling financially. Clearly the income wasn't sufficient to keep it going. And I get the impression from reading about Drummond that he was a man of many talents and many enthusiasms, but probably not a very good businessman. And in 1841, he was forced into bankruptcy. He had to sell his houses beside the rosary and many of his prized possessions, his books, and his scientific instruments were auctioned. He'd been giving lessons at the house because he'd been traditionally a teacher. He had a school in uh, uh, Philby and he also had a school in Norwich in his early years, but he seemed to have not attracted many pupils there. He left the rosary to live with his daughter, Margaret in Kick Street, and he lived with her until his death 10 years later. But in a way, he was very fortunate. He had a good group of supporters and friends, and they came to his rescue and formed a trust which took over the management of the rosary and continued to employ Drummond as their secretary. By his death in 1852, the rosary was well established. It was the place where all the leading dissenting families would bury their dead. There were an average about two burials a week and almost 2,000 burials had been interred there since it opened 30 years before. Drummond himself was buried in the family plot here under the yew tree, which you can't really see very well, where his wife had been buried and where his other members of his family were subsequently buried. I think one of the factors that also increased the number of burials at the Rosary were 
outbreaks of cholera, which I mentioned earlier. There was a particularly sad case in 1854, which illustrated the threat posed by the disease when William Rowe, the school teacher in Poxhorpe, died. The school in Poxhorpe catered for one of the poorest districts in this city. It was a bit like Higham. It was an area with cramped housing, poor sanitation, and diseases like cholera spread quite quickly. August of that year had been a hot and humid month, and there was an outbreak of cholera in Poxhorpe. And not only was this dangerous for the people in, the, in there, but it was catastrophic for the Rowe family. On the Wednesday, the 30th of August, his daughter Matilda was taken ill and died at 8 p.m. that evening. The same day, his son Henry came home, said he was feeling unwell. He died at midnight. His youngest son, Herbert, had been sent away once his other children had shown the symptoms of cholera, but he, he still contracted the disease and died on the Thursday. So on the Friday of that week, Paul William had the dreadful duty of arranging the funerals and organising the burials. Upon returning home that day, he found he had the symptoms of cholera and he died very quickly and was buried on the Saturday. So it's an appalling example of how a disease like cholera, which is transmitted by infected water, can, can kill, as it still does in the third world, of course. After Drummond's death in 1851, the trustees improved the management of the rosary. They established an office in Norwich on Bag Plain, and they improved the administration of the rosary by making the record keeping much more comprehensive than accurate. They would have been aware at the time that there were plans by the city corporation to establish a new churchyard and close all the, sorry, a new cemetery and close all the city's churchyards, and that this would have been competition for the rosary. So in 1855, they extended the rosary northwards by buying a further four acres. This presented a slight problem because the land to the north, if you've been to the rosary, you'll know it's quite steep. And if you have graves dug on a hillside, the likelihood is that as you loosen the soil, once you get heavy rain, the soil is washed away, along with the graves and the coffins. So what they did was to terrace it. Thank you. Uh, to advice. This was overcome by terracing the hillside. Uh, they put in a series of terraces, probably, I think there are four, and on each terrace they had two rows of graves. And they also inserted steps made from what in the later part of the 19th century, but they probably used railway sleepers, I think. And also put in cobbled drainage channels, which you can just see there. And the purpose of those was to take away the surface water after heavy rain and direct it down into the surface water sewer in Rosary Road. The cemetery itself was walled off and it was only open for funerals and on Sunday afternoons. And the reason for the wall and to keep it um, closed was not just to keep it exclusive, but it was also to protect it from vandalism. It, there were several recorded instances of people being taken to court for stealing plants or vandalising shrubs in the rosary. But it was the job of the superintendent to make sure that these things were kept in check. Uh, the superintendent was, uh, it was a job that was uh, much sought after. It came with a a house which is behind the office and that's the office on Rosary Road which was built in 1860 and provided a contact point for people. The superintendent was usually an ex-policeman 
they were robust enough to deal with any antisocial behavior and usually had a presence about them which was uh, good at funerals but some of them were quite difficult to manage there was a man called Francis Connors who had to be reprimanded by the trustees for being drunk at a funeral whilst the superintendent was responsible for the maintenance of the cemetery the trustees used to do regular tours to make sure that the cemetery was being kept up kept spick and span and if they came across any graves which were perhaps railings are a bit loose or the curbstones had been cleared of weeds they would reprimand the the owner of the plot because if you bought a plot in the rosary you were responsible for looking after it if you didn't if you didn't want a simple plot in the rosary there wasn't an alternative you could have a vault the vaults were built of brick and had within them shelves for coffins so if you had a an eight foot square family plot you could have about i suppose eight or nine shelves in there and that would provide for members of your family in the future some people had double double family plots and could accommodate 13 or 14. what you would do is have the brick, brick built vault and on top the memorial would be installed the difficulty that then arose is how you got future burials in, in the into the vault and you just had to dig down beside it and if you were lucky there's a metal door that you could open and put the coffin in if you're unlucky you have to remove the brickwork put the coffin in re-brick it up again and reinstate it the rosary is not like some of the, the fancier london cemeteries like highgate for example there's only one mausoleum at the rosary and that's the mausoleum of a man called Emmanuel Cooper. Cooper was a doctor. He was an eye specialist who lived in a house beside the Irving Room Gate of the cathedral. The house is no longer there, but it stood very roughly where the statue of Edith Cavill now stands. I don't I never know whether it's Cavill or Cavell, but I would say use the Norwich way of um, and according to R. H. Mottram, who was a local author of some repute, Cooper had the mausoleum built during his lifetime. And on a Sunday afternoon, he would go up there and sit in the doorway and admire the view while smoking his pipe and no doubt thinking that someday he would be in the mausoleum. His coffin is in the mausoleum and because he's buried above ground, it's a lead-lined coffin, and below the mausoleum is a vault that contains two members of his family. Cooper's claim to fame, it's slightly dubious, is that he had a relationship with a woman called Anna Julia Pearson, Anna Julia Pearson, who lived in Victoria Street, whose daughter was called Ada Nemesis, and she became the second wife of John Galsworth. Although grand mausoleums were not a feature of the rosary, grand funerals certainly were. Funerals of major figures would effectively bring the city to a standstill. And that of Jeremiah James Coleman in 1898 was one such. At the time of his death in 1898, Coleman's his business was the largest employer in the city, employing 2,500 people at the Carrow Works, and sending starch, mustard, and washing blue across the country and abroad. Coleman had also been a member of Parliament for Norwich for more than 20 years. When he died at Corton near Lowestoft, his body was brought back to Norwich by train. It was then carried in an open coffin up Prince of Wales Road to the Congregational Church in Princess Street, where the funeral service took place. The cortege, by now, comprising a number of carriages followed by what was estimated to be about 1,200 people from the Carrow Works, then returned down Prince of Wales Road to the Rosary, passing crowds of, it was described, of enormous dimensions, a bit like a 
I suppose a, a successful football team returning home, many of whom were in morning dress, and many of the businesses had pulled down the shades to show their, their um, appreciate, appreciation of Coleman. At the Rosary, many more people were gathered, and there were so many people that the police had to be called to protect them, protect the uh, the graves from being trampled on. And on the hillside above the grave, the band from the Parrot Works played suitable funereal music. Although Coleman's funeral was not was exceptional, it was not unique. And the next slide shows this is George White's funeral from 1912. It's a bit difficult to see, but this here is the monument, which is above the vault. There's actually a vault behind all those flowers. So the vault was dug, the monument was put on top of the vault. And when the funeral took place in, in 1912, in the, I think it's the May of 1912, over 3,000 people were reported to have attended. And as late as 1928, when Charles Thurston, the showman and cinema proprietor, died, his funeral attracted people not only from Norfolk and Norwich, but from Ireland and further afield, because he was such a well-known and respected figure in the circus world. By the time we get to 1901, almost 10,000 burials had taken place. And the rosary was starting to fill up. It may seem quite a large number, but if you look at some of the larger London cemeteries, it's infinitesimal. For example, Tower Hammers, in the first 50 years after it was opened, over a quarter of a million people were buried there. Although I think it's fair to say that, like, this, like some of the other larger London cemeteries, a lot of people were buried in public mass graves. By the 1920s, the hilly area brought in 1855 was filling up, although some of it was so steep that it couldn't be used, and the trustees decided that they would extend the cemetery. A further four and a half acres to the north was purchased, and the rosary was extended all the way through from Rosary Road to Telegraph Lane East. A road was laid from Rosary Road, which took ran around the edge of the cemetery so you can now drive from Rosary Road right into the upper part of the cemetery. The new part opened in 1924 and it's currently where burials and the insertion of ashes and green burials take place. At one point the trustees did consider building a crematorium at the Rosary but when they looked at the cost, particularly the cost of heating a crematorium to the temperature required to incinerate one body, they, they found that they were just prohibitive, so that idea was abandoned. By the 1950s, the trustees were struggling financially. There was no longer the income required to maintain it to the required standard, and it was decided that they would look to pass on the responsibility to somebody else, and that was passed on to the city council. This is a that's just a shot of the upper cemetery, and you can see it's basically like early, most modern cemeteries with uh grass that's e easy to maintain and very, very low monuments. So, appropriately, the last chairman of the trustees was R.H. Mottram, whose uh, family had been involved in the rosary ever since the earliest days. Currently in the Rosary, about 20,000 people buried there in the upper and the lower parts. Uh, there are still spaces, but it's changed a little bit in that you can, can no longer reserve a, a space. You used to be able to buy space in advance, but you can't do that now because what was happening was that people were buying spaces in the, in the cemetery and then not dying. So it's a bit <laughs> unreasonable of them. <laughs> Before concluding, I wanted to just mention a couple of the people who were interred at the Rosary, because I think if you know a bit about some of the people who are buried there, you get a feel for what Norwich was like in the heyday of the Rosary in the late 19th century. And I've picked a couple. One of them was George Chamberlain. 
He was the grandson of the founder of Chamberlain's department store on Guildhall Hill. Anybody re remember that? Well, it's quite surprising because although it closed in, I think, the 60s, when we do our tours, we still get people who say, yes, my mum worked there, or I, I, I remember going there as a child. At the time of the, well, the early 20th century, although it had been opened as a draper's shop, it became the city's most palatial department store. The door, which is at the corner of Dove Street, and you probably know the building I'm talking about, as it used to be Tesco's on Guildhall Hill, you'd be greeted by a uniformed commissionaire, he would hand you over to a floor walker, who would take you to the department of your choice. Behind the counters would be all these little wooden boxes containing haberdashery. Once you'd selected what you wanted, it would be packed, you could either take it with you, or they would deliver it to your home. Chamberlain's also had a large wholesale trade throughout East Anglia and a factory making uniforms and uh, rainwear in Bothwell Street. George Chamberlain died in 1928 at St Catherine's Close on All Saints Green. And St Catherine's Close is, I'm sure you'll know, where the BBC used to be in Norwich. The rosary isn't just the, uh, the burial place of the great and good. It's also the burial place of ordinary people and people who perhaps came to a tragic end. A one such as William Parr. William was only aged five and a half. He was the son of a tobacconist in Prince of Wales Road. And one day he was playing by the river with one of his friends and they were swinging on a rope attached to a wherry. You can guess what happened. He fell in. Although the body was recovered within 30 minutes, the poor lad was dead. And the coroner's comments probably ring true today that more needed to be do, done to make the river a bit safer. Perhaps a surprising aspect of the rosary to people who don't know it is the number of military graves there. There are over 30 Commonwealth war graves and there are also over a hundred other graves who are connected in some way with the military. For example, there's a, a sailor who fought in one of the battles of the Napoleonic Wars. There are two survivors of the charge of the Light Brigade. There are men and women from both world wars, including quite a few of the air raid victims from the surrounding area. And there are also a number of cavalry men who were based at the former barracks on back on on Barrack Street, where well, you'd expect them to be based there, wouldn't you? Um, one thing I haven't mentioned is oh, is the symbology of the monuments at the Rosary. How people remember their, their dead. This is perhaps one of the most common, and it's the clasped hands that demonstrate a loving relationship, usually of man and wife. And you can see that on the left is a, a frilly female cuff, and on the right is a formal, and I think it's got a stud or a butt, a male. Um, the other one, of course, is angels. There are quite a few angels in the rosary. Quite often they would have been bought in from abroad. And occasionally you come across um, memorials that reflect the occupation of the people buried there. And this, as you can see, is a, a reasonably accurate, accurate uh, replica of a train, a locomotive. And I think this is perhaps the best, one of the best known. It's a, it's a wrought iron um, memorial to the Hines family. The Hines family were uh, founders and metal workers who had uh, premises in St. Margaret Street. And if you look carefully, about halfway down, can you see the little heads? We've been told by a member of the family that those little heads represent some of the people who are actually buried there. Today, the Rosary is functioning cemetery, but it's also a much valued green space. And it's a home for lots of 
birds, about 30 different species of birds, if not more, bunchjack deer, foxes, lots of small hat mammals, including hedgehogs. And although it's owned and managed by the city council, the Friends of the Rosary, which I've won, organise tours, uh, we do research, and in the autumn and winter, we organise clearance sessions. So if you'd like to be involved, we're always looking for volunteers. But the talk doesn't really do full credit to the Rosary. You need to visit it. And one of the best times to go is after the turn of the year when all the bulbs are out. In certain parts of the Rosary, there's a profusion of spring flowers. And you get the daylight today and we've got the huge beech tree which dominates the upper part of the cemetery and all the crocuses. The story is that the chap who worked there for a long, long time always had a, a pocket full of bulbs when he went round. And if he came to a bare spot, he'd put some in. That's the end of my talk.